I put a thimble on my thumb. My thumb it was too thick. Try, Try another, another finger then. Says finger then, Dick. said little br brother Dick. Paul used to go up the stairs every night and I would hear him in his bedroom. I couldn't hear him very well because the door was closed. And then I discovered that he had this little black book, but you weren't allowed to see inside it. This little black book looks harmless enough. But when I was a child, the contents made my life hell. Everyone else could talk normally and this made me feel ashamed and embarrassed. I put a thimble on my th th thumb. I got a lot of pressure from my dad. He didn't understand. He used to just send me up to my bedroom to practice saying these nursery rhymes. And he'd be waiting for me when I came down. I'd have to string a sentence or two in front of him without hesitating or stumbling. As soon as I would go, ah, 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 he used to say, way back up to your room to practice. At Halloween and Easter, Dad used to arrange treasure hunts around the house for us. It was great fun. But then he would suggest a wee test, something like sums or mostly spellings. I love treasure hunts, because I love sweets. But I hate it, what came before them, the spelling test. Dad would get Paul to spell the words again and again, and Paul would get more and more frustrated, because he couldn't spell the words and he would be stammering. And then Dad would be getting angrier and Paul, I think, was very um, embarrassed uh, until Mum came into the room and would say, right, that's enough. This is meant to be a party. School was an absolute nightmare for me. I didn't know when I started to hate school. Everyone in my class knew I stammered. From the first day when I was asked my name, I was aware of maybe 30 pairs of eyes laughing at me and giggling. And trying to then get pa, trying to get Paul out. So I hated anything to do. I liked lots of noise and racket because then the teacher wouldn't, as long as I wasn't making it, then the teacher wouldn't point you out. So, so that was, and I, and I knew that, you know, you could talk better than me, you could write better and spell better than me, and um, I'm in this, in this hell of a place, and looking at my wee sister, who's perfect, and my older sister, and wondered, you know, what, what's, why can't I talk like everyone else? Silence meant fear, because it meant a, a, a speaking opportunity, which was I was going to stammer, which meant more laughter, which meant more humiliation and shame, and which just added to the fact that you're stupid. In secondary school, the classes were bigger. I thought I could go unnoticed, but no such luck. There was one teacher, Martin Thombry, who had more patience with me and didn't single me out. Well, that may well have been true, Paul, but I mean, it, it would be the reasons for that. It would be different from what you were thinking in that I felt some embarrassment because of the embarrassment you were under, it may have been that 
in some ways it could have been disruptive to the to the rest of the class because other kids maybe start making fun of you or they start losing patience and then start losing their concentration. Not surprisingly, I left when I was 16 with no qualifications. As we got older, I noticed how Paul would avoid certain situations. He would never make phone calls himself, he would never go to the shop, you had to do that for him. If we bumped into each other in a pub, I would have seen you sometimes uh, struggle telling a joke, very, very funny, witty guy, couldn't get to his punchline, and I would watch people around him kind of becoming embarrassed, and I could see Paul was mortified by that. When I met you again at that time, Paul, you know, my reaction was that you were stammering very badly, and I certainly thought it seemed to be a lot worse than I remembered. Um, I suppose it did take me by surprise, really, you know. For a time, alcohol seemed to ease my stomach. I would need to be drunk to chat up girls. I tried hypnotherapy. I spent a small fortune, but it was never going to work. I was depressed. I was in my mid-thirties and were saying to the fact that I was going to stammer forever. I couldn't sleep one night and I was uh, channel flicking and I came across a repeat of a Trevor MacDonald uh, programme tonight with Trevor MacDonald and I thought initially that the, the report was about charlatans who were taking money off people who were stammering and as I watched more of it I realised that wasn't the case, that this Maguire programme that they were talking about was helping people with chronic stammers and so I had to hold tight and the first thing the next morning I got on the phone to him and said Paul I think there's something that you should look into. The Maguire programme sounded hopeful. It was a nerve-wracking experience for me but at that stage anything was worth a shot. Checklist. The first part of the checklist is why the checklist. Every girl Public figures and celebrities like Gareth Gates were finding success on the programme. Well, having a stammer, I was never able to be the person that I wanted to be. And I wanted people to see that I was fun and charismatic and, and all of those things, but it held me back and I was a different person because I wasn't able, I didn't have a voice. And so, yeah, I... I thought that people viewed me firstly as, you know, that guy who can't speak and they was never really able to get to know the true me. Part of it is a breathing exercise. You have to put a belt across your chest. This enables you to speak at the top of your breath. You have to incorporate other techniques as well, which you need to practice constantly every day. Recovery starts with a mechanical leg speech using very short sentences. Talking to people who, who you may think is more um, intelligent than you. Paul came back from uh, his first weekend of the Maguire program. He was very high. When I say high, he was very excited. And I noticed when he was talking, he was breathing kind of differently but he didn't seem to be uh, stammering, no excitedly stammering. So he said to my mum and me, do you want to see this tape? And he put the tape on and it was himself and other members of the Maguire programme taking their turns of standing on the box and saying, and saying their names out loud and saying, my name is Paul Verlai and I'm a fluent speaker. And I had never heard Paul talk like that before. Paul Verlack is my name. <laughs> I'm glad I came on this course. I would have never spoken public. When I finished my first weekend at the Maguire program, I felt, I felt freedom for the first time. For the first time, I had a technique that I could say what I wanted 
Because uh, I could say, I could say a natural sentence. As a stammer, one of my biggest fears was to ask directions. We weren't used to you doing any talking really, that was done for you and it was great that you were doing it yourself, so my heart was in my mouth, hoping that you would get the words out, and you did. It was that confidence that I was able to walk into a literacy class. Mm. I felt stupid. I knew I wasn't stupid, and I started off from there and just my ambitions was, I want to go to university. You know, you were you always had joked with me and said, ah, you're the smart one, but it turns out that's not, not the case, it's you. And, uh, <laughs> I always knew I was smarter than you. <laughs> I'll agree with uh, that. Paul Verlack. My thumb it was too thick. Try another finger then, says little brother Dick. Thank you.